bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, and the Holland Blurview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation. We would also like to thank the following Keystone partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. My name is Doug Maynard and I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And today's webinar is titled Beyond Inactivity and Unhealthy Diet. How should we address obesity in 2015? Mm -hmm. So uh, once again, it's great uh, to welcome back uh, some of our colleagues from uh, the CHEO Research Institute. As you uh, heard in the beginning, uh, in the intro, uh, the CHEO Research Institute is one of our KT partners. Uh, and in addition to providing funding that allows us to make sure these webinars that we're allowed to, that we're able to do these webinars for free and to post the recordings for free we really appreciate the contributions from our KT partners but we also uh, are uh, excited to work with great organizations like the CHEO Research Institute to have them bring some of their what is re what is really leading edge content in the world in many many areas of child and youth uh, health research so it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter today who's coming to us from the CHEO Research uh, Institute uh, Dr. Jean-Philippe Chaput who's from the Healthy, Active, Living, and Obesity Research Group within the CHEO-RI. And Dr. Chaput is a research scientist at, uh, at the CHEO-RI and, and an assistant uh, professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Ottawa. His research focuses on obesity prevention and the adoption of a healthy lifestyle. And he's also interested in new determinants of obesity, such as lack of sleep and mental stress and all sorts of other great uh, things uh, around obesity. And he's got tons of awards and stuff that you can see in his bio on, uh, on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Um, and please uh, don't hesitate to go and uh, check that out. But uh, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to uh, Dr. Jean-Philippe Chaput. Over to you. Thank you very much, Doug. Okay, so uh, hi uh, everybody. So it's always uh, a bit weird for me to give those kinds of lectures because I always prefer to see people, to see faces and uh, uh, have a lot of questions, but hopefully I've done that a couple of times. So uh, my presentation will be about 45 minutes, so hopefully plenty of time for your, your questions and feel free to email me. Uh, you can Google me, you will find me, but my email will be at the, the last slide at the end of this presentation if you have any uh, questions that you uh, didn't ask, so if you just feel free to send me a, an email and you can even call me too. So today what I plan to do with you is, of course, uh, during 45 minutes, I uh, kind of talk about all aspects of uh, obesity prevention and treatment, but I will just raise a couple of things that I think are uh, important or some things that we don't talk a lot. So I think uh, the title, as, you, as you, you can see, Beyond Inactivity and Unhealthy Diet, I think uh, it's important for us to address the root causes of the problem and to see uh, overeating and lack of exercise more as symptoms of something deeper. And those causes can be very different between people. Uh, okay, so I'm part of the HALO research group for Healthy Active Living and Obesity Research Group at TORI. Uh, this is our website, helloresearch.ca, if you want to learn more, but mainly we are the only full-time research group in Canada dedicated solely to the prevention and treatment of obesity in kids. Uh, because we work full time in research uh, doing uh, trying to find solutions and things like that for children with excess body weight and uh, the complication associated with excess body weight. So if you want to know more about our team members, our publications, our different projects, so I, I encourage you to go to our website and this is updated on a daily basis. Okay, you know that we're getting fatter if we look over the past few years. Uh, you have data here from the U.S. Um, so over the past few years, we gained weight. Uh, the prevalence of overweight and obesity has increased. Now we see kind of a plateau, but the rates are pretty high. But at the same time, if you look at the number of publications per year uh, when you just enter the word obesity, there's just so many publications and more and more. So we seem to understand much more uh, what to do about obesity, how to prevent it, how to treat it. 
but we're not able to bring down those high rates of obesity. And why is that? I think there are different reasons. But there was a nice piece uh, published in 2011 by Whitaker, and what this guy said, he said that one explanation uh, may be that obesity, like how all, uh, all health uh, conditions that are determined by I, by our society, resist durable solutions until there is a change in societal, societal norms and the values underlying those norms. So meaning that if we go to the root causes of the problem, it is much beyond excess food intake or just telling people to eat less and to, to move more. So now we realize that it doesn't work very well. So we need to address uh, other things. And we go, uh, he was talking about, for example, uh, to reduce the gap between the rich and the poor, to, to things like that. So things to really help uh, obese people, uh, it's it's more more broad than just eating less and moving more and those changes are not easy to to achieve so why do we uh, do we get fatter why do we do we have more obese people uh, in 2015 than before there are many reasons of course we talk a lot about excess food intake and lack of exercise as the two main pillars that are put forward to explain this uh, high rate of obesity around the globe but uh, uh, in this uh, Downey Obesity Report, and I just look at the 2015, so uh, apparently there were 82 causes or p possible causes of obesity, and now we're, we're at 104 causes. So as you can see, excess food intake and lack of exercise are just two of those 100 causes. So there are many things that can explain why people gain weight, and the reasons can be very different between people too. And Dr. George Bray uh, said a couple of years ago uh, that uh, our genes load the, the gun, but our environment pulls the trigger. So some people are more likely than others to gain weight and to be obese, of course, because of our genes, so we cannot really change that. But <clears throat> the factors that we find in our so-called toxic environment, uh, there are many uh, factors that it becomes easy for people to eat too much and not to move enough. So I think uh, that this is where we can have a, a role, I think. So just a couple of uh, examples. So excess body weight is an, an interaction between our genes and many factors that we can find in our uh, society. So we know, for example, drugs that, uh, that can cause weight gain, the drugs that we prescribe for mental health problems have been shown to uh, produce weight gain. Uh, sedentariness, so we sit a lot. Uh, we, uh, we have a lot of, of, of chair time in our day, uh, so it can be TV, the computers, the laptops, tablets, and so on. Uh, lack of physical activity, so in Canada, only uh, about 15% of adults meet the physical activity guidelines of 150 minutes of uh, moderate to vigorous physical activity per day, and only uh, and only about 10% of kids meet the guidelines of one hour of physical activity per, per day. So there is, of course, a physical inactivity crisis. A lack of sleep, there's more and more studies linking uh, poor sleep habits uh, with weight gain and obesity. Uh, energy den density in our food. Uh, mental stress, so we experience much more mental stress uh, now than before with more burnout and so on, and mental stress can uh, increase food intake and we can gain weight. Uh, mental health, birth weight, uh, chemical pollutants, so air pollutants or even pollutants that we can find in our food have been shown to uh, be associated with excess body weight. Meal size, so a larger portion uh, has been shown that we eat more and then it, we can gain weight. Low circuit mix status, lack of time, so it's more difficult for families with kids and they work and so on to find time to exercise and to cook and things like that. So uh, we tend to eat more uh, uh, fast food and, and so on. So there's just many, many reasons. And again, uh, there's not one solution for everybody. Uh, it's not one size fits all. And those causes can be different between people. And that's why we need to uh, tailor our interventions to each and every person. Because uh, if we don't uh, really address the root causes of the problem, it will not work. So do we uh, 
spend too much energy on the big two factors, excess food intake and lack of exercise. So in my opinion, yes, because I see those two factors as symptoms of something deeper. So we should ask rather, why do we eat too much and why we don't move enough? And when we dig a bit deeper, we realize that it's explained by other factors. So we don't sleep enough, can be stress, lack of time, and things like that. So th we need to work on those factors to uh, to have an, an impact on energy in, energy out, and then body weight, as opposed to just telling people, uh, you need to eat less, you need to move more, so it's easy to say, but we now understand that all of the, the programs we are uh, just telling people to eat less and move more, uh, it doesn't work very well. It can work on the short term, uh, but over the long term, people tend to regain weight. So about 95% of people who are on a diet will regain their weight at some point. So this is not very uh, good numbers. Uh, just to show that it's well beyond in, uh, uh, energy in and energy out. So in 2006, we were one of the first to report. So we pulled together all the risk factors for overweight and obesity in children using the Quebec Enfant Project, a large cohort of, uh, of kids in the province of Quebec. And we're amazed to see that the winner, or I will say loser, of risk factors for overweight and obesity in this cohort was short sleep duration with an odd ratio of 3.45. So meaning that short sleepers were 3.5 times more at risk of being overweight or obese compared to long sleepers. So uh, th that was the, 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 the first one. The second one was parental obesity. So we know uh, a lot about this. So if you have one or two parents obese, your kids are more likely to be obese. The third one was excess television viewing. And then we had low socioeconomic status and physical inactivity. So even short sleep was a better predictor of excess body weight than physical inactivity in this cohort. So we did a similar thing in adults in the Quebec, in the Quebec family study. And again, lack of, of sleep was the main predictor. So again, if we dig deeper, so uh, lack of sleep can impact eating behaviors and physical activity behaviors because short sleepers tend to be more tired, so less likely to uh, exercise because of this uh, fatigue. And also we know that lack of sleep is a stressor and we feel more hungry, so we have more time to eat when we don't sleep enough. So again, uh, by digging deeper, we realize that uh, it can influence eating behaviors and physical activity behaviors of short sleepers. And now we know more, so this is just uh, one meta uh, analysis that was published a couple of years ago showing that uh, we know more and more about uh, the fact that lack of sleep can cause weight gain over time. Uh, here uh, they were showing that adults sleeping less than five hours per night are 55% more likely to be obese than those sleeping more than five hours per night. And kids sleeping less than 10 hours per night are 89% more likely to be obese than those sleeping more than 10 hours per night. So uh, what are the mechanisms that can explain why lack of sleep can lead to weight gain over time? The main one is through an increase in food intake uh, to the different things. So lack of sleep uh, changes key appetite hormones, so leptin, ghrelin, cortisol, so we feel more hungry when we don't sleep enough. But also we have more time and more opportunities for eating. So for example, if you sleep four hours per night, you awake for 20. So you have 20 hours uh, exposed to this modern obesogenic en environment. So you have more time and more opportunities for, uh, for snacking and so on. And we know that short sleepers eat more meals per day and they snack more. On the other side of the energy balance equation, not energy in, but energy out. So lack of sleep as, uh, can increase fatigue for people, and some people might decide to reduce their physical activity le level. But it seems uh, very likely, according to uh, a lot of recent studies, that the energy in uh, side of the energy balance equation is the main mechanism explaining the link between lack of sleep and weight gain over time. And also in a context of weight loss, so it's not only lack of sleep predicting weight gain, but for the same physical activity or diet. So if you are if you are a short sleeper, you can ex expect to lose less body fat than if you're a good sleeper. So then more and more studies now showing that uh, good sleeping habits can uh, predict the success of weight loss programs. For different reasons, we know that short sleepers have higher ghrelin levels and ghrelin uh, tends to, fa to facilitate the retention of body fat. So we keep more of this body fat in the context of a weight loss program. And also it's more difficult for short sleepers to keep up with a, a diet plan because they already feel more hungry. And when you cut calories in their diet, they, they, 
this drive to eat is just uh, much more uh, increased. So uh, they don't really stick to the weight loss program. So uh, asking questions about sleep is uh, sleep hygiene. I think it's a very uh, clever thing to do uh, if uh, you embark on a weight loss program. And now uh, addressing sleep for weight management has been endorsed by the Canadian, Canadian Obesity Network, which is the largest obesity organization in the world uh, with more than 10,000 members. So uh, they now have uh, sleep as part of their five A's of obesity management. So I think uh, because they understand uh, the influence of sleeping habits on uh, eating behaviors and on physical activity behaviors. And I also have people coming to me uh, asking, okay, uh, GP, I'm a short sleeper, uh, I'm obese, what if I sleep more? Can I expect to lose weight by sleeping more? And my answer is no, of course, uh, but the good news is that you don't expect to lose weight by sleeping more, but if you change your bad sleeping habits into good sleeping habits, you can uh, prevent future weight gain, which is a good thing. So what we did here, it was the first time to show that. That was not in children, though it was in, in adults. The control group were adults sleeping the good zone between seven and eight hours of sleep per night. In the middle, we had adults sleeping who had short sleepers, less than six hours per night, who changed their sleeping habits from less than six to seven to eight. And on the right-hand side, you have the chronic short sleepers, those who were sleeping less than six hours per night who maintained their bad sleeping habits over time. And you have the follow-up of six years, and you have the change in fat mass in kilogram on the y-axis. And you can see that the chronic short sleepers on the right-hand side gain about four kilos over the follow-up period, but no significant differences between the control group and those who increase their sleep duration. So two good news for me. First, it's possible to change bad sleeping habits into good sleeping habits, and by doing so, you can limit a future fat gain. So don't expect to lose weight, but you can uh, prevent future weight gain. If you're wondering about the sleep guidelines, the recommendations, uh, you can go to the, the National Sleep Foundation website. But roughly uh, for school-age children between 6 and 13, the recommendation is between 9 and 11 hours per night. For teenagers, it's between 8 and 10. And for adults, between 7 and 9. Of course, those are uh, for public health, so uh, if you sleep a bit less than those guidelines or more, it doesn't mean that uh, you're at high risk of health problems. So it's always uh, those guidelines for a, on a chronic basis. And also, it's possible our genes explain a lot our sleep needs, so have, again, have a, some of my friends, they came to me, a GP, I sleep six hours per night, I feel fresh, uh, is it a problem? No, so it's, it's possible to be outside those ranges and be okay. So that's the difference between uh, uh, when we look at for each and every person versus on a population health standpoint. And also beyond duration, of course, other di dimensions of sleep are um, um, important, so sleep quality, sleep timing, like bedtime and so on, uh, they are also very important. Uh, we are in the process of changing our physical activity guidelines in Canada, and they will be released in 2016, in June 2016, and they will be the world's first integrated 24-hour movement behavior guidelines. We start with children and teenagers, but then we want to expand to adults and preschoolers and so on after that. Uh, because it's a long process, it takes about two years to come up with guidelines. Uh, there's many steps to follow. Uh, we do want to have a very robust process. But why we want to do that over 24 hours now? Because uh, the current physical activity guidelines are only about moderate to vigorous physical ac activity. <clears throat> and we know that light uh, physical activity is very uh, important to like walking. So walking is not part of the guidelines, but we know that there's benefits of uh, active play and walking. And sleep will be part of the new guidelines, too, because of the benefits of having a good night's sleep as well. So I think over the past years, we look at this 5% of the pie, this moderate to vigorous physical activity. But then the 95%, the rest of the day matters as well for overall health. So having a good night's sleep to limit screen time and to uh, engage in some light physical activity. Of course, other behaviors matter like diet and uh, smoking and things like that. But of course, uh, now we just uh, start with the movement behaviors, so the 24-hour movement behaviors. Uh, one thing that has changed as well over the past few years is uh, you can see the, the monkey man here uh, evolving towards 
a man highly involved in physical labor using muscles to the modern man using uh, his brain, using laptops, uh, the, com the computers. Uh, I think that's a reality of uh, our work day. Uh, even me, I work a lot with my uh, uh, com computer. <clears throat> and uh, I think we just, we're just trying to understand the implications of this new way of working. So we use, we use more our brain, less our muscles. But it's not only a matter of a decrease in the amount of physical activity over time, but there are implications of just mental work, per se, on uh, energy balance. And we did a couple of studies. I will just show one here. Uh, that was in uh, female university students in Quebec City. We compared the uh, two conditions. The, every participant was engaged in both uh, sessions. So 45 minutes of resting, so 45 minutes of just relaxing on the couch, versus 45 minutes of computing, so reading, writing. So I, we gave the participants a text. They had to do a summary using a computer, using Word, over 45 minutes. We measured their energy expenditure and their energy intake in a lunch following this, uh, those two sessions. So on the left hand side you have the energy expenditure, so a difference of 13 kilojoule more uh, burned or three calories burned more after uh, the reading writing session compared to rest, so that was not significant. Signific signific significantly different. So it's false to say that hard thinking or burns more calories. But if you look at the effects on food intake on the right hand side, difference of about 230 calories eaten more after reading writing. So the balance was about uh, a net caloric surplus of 230 calories after reading writing. And there was no compensation for the rest of the day. So uh, meaning that, yeah, the type of work we're doing is not only that we don't burn a lot of calories, but it promotes uh, overeating as well. Uh, in, if, in the participants, we're not feeling more hungry, but they ate more. So it's kind of a reward for the brain when we use uh, mental work. We had also blood samples, and we saw, we saw changes in uh, uh, glucose and so on. So uh, and. We published a letter just to highlight the fact that uh, mental stress or using the, the, our, our uh, laptops, for example, are uh, stressful for our hormones and they may impair satiety signal capacity. And we think that they deserve to be counterbalanced by an adequate physical activity regimen because uh, we have, we use too much our brain and not enough our muscles, so we need to find a good balance between mental activity and physical like, activity. The solution is not to get rid of our uh, laptops, but at least if we can compensate by moving more, we can, pref uh, we can prevent the orexigenic effects of mental stress. So it's just to find a, a better balance in our lifestyle. And we found the same thing with uh, seated video gaming. We, I did that in Copenhagen during my postdoc. Uh, in teenagers, one hour of complete rest on a couch versus one hour of uh, computing. We measured energy expenditure and energy intake, and the teenagers ate more after playing seated video gaming than after complete rest on a couch. So again, it adds a new dimension of uh, to sedentariness. So sedentariness is not only uh, because we don't burn a lot of calories, but if those activities also promote overconsumption of food, it's worse than just uh, sitting. And now we have many studies showing that the type of uh, activity uh, matters a lot. So reading for pleasure doesn't seem to increase food intake, but screen time seems to promote overconsumption of food. So it's not only a matter of uh, burning calories, energy in, energy out, but the type of activities we're doing matters. So screen time is worse than non-screen centered behavior on energy intake and overall health. <clears throat> I'll talk a bit about pollution. We have more and more studies showing that the pollution, like it can be air pollution or pollution in our food. Uh, the, or those or organochlorine compounds have been shown to be associated with excess body weight. So there is no calories associated with them, but they seem to uh, uh, to matter to energy in, energy out, and they're associated with weight gain over, over time. So this is something we need to think about in the future as well. So in our society where we value a lot uh, productivity and money making at the expense of our environment, so but one side effect of uh, pollution is also uh, that it can be an increase of our waste, waistlines.
So I think we, sh we need to ask more the why and not the, the what. So seeing obesity as a sign and overeating and lack of exercise are more symptoms of something deeper. So we're looking more at the root causes of the problem. And of course, uh, uh, overeating and lack of exercise are more uh, uh, the symptoms of something deeper. And obesity is not a, a choice. I think people don't decide one day, okay, I want to become obese at some point. No. So it's, we need to understand that this is very complex, and we see a lot of weight bias and stigmatization with obese people. Uh, I, I will say people with obesity. This is something we need uh, to say. Um, because, yeah, our genes play a role. It can be like there's just so many, many reasons that can explain uh, Weight, weight gain over time. I think people don't decide to become obese. And it's well beyond energy in, energy out. So the underlying causes and paths to obesity are manifold, and no one is immune. I'm not, you are not. We never know what can happen in the future, to, so things can change. Examples, uh, change in uh, economic status. So if I were to lose my job tomorrow, maybe uh, I might decide to buy uh, more energy-dense food that are cheaper and so on, so it can have an impact, uh, and I might gain weight, uh, reduce activity due to injury or illness. If I were to lose my legs, uh, of course, of course, I will reduce my physical activity level and I might gain weight. Uh, introduction to an obesogenic drug, so drugs that we prescribe for schizophrenia, uh, mental health problem, and so on. Depression have been shown to cause weight gain, so uh, that can be one explanation. Moving to a, a less walkable community. So I lived in, in Copenhagen and Denmark for two years between 2008 and 2010. And I don't know if you've been there, but there are biking paths everywhere there. It's just easy, safe, and spontaneous for people to use their bike uh, to uh, commute and to just uh, go everywhere. But of course, if you live in a city uh, that is more difficult to be active, uh, so it can, it can also impact your physical activity level and your, your body weight too, so it's, and more and more. There are just so many different reasons, and those things can change over time. Uh, obesity prevention is a complex issue. So we know that living in an obesogenic environment, so this toxic environment that promotes overeating and uh, that minimizes energy ex expenditure, uh, makes achieving a healthy lifestyle close to um, impossible. So it's very difficult for people to swim upstream against this tide of obeso obesogenic pressures. So it's, it's easier for people to uh, have unhealthy lifestyle. Uh, and there's strong evidence showing that a change in the environment and the conditions of poverty is what is needed to tackle obesity at the population level. So there are nice data by uh, Gary Egger in, in uh, Australia showing that you have on the y-axis here the gross domestic product per capita, and on the y-axis the body mass index, or the prevalence of, of obesity if you want. So you can see a strong correlation, positive correlation, with the rich, the rich countries on the top right uh, end panel uh, having a higher prevalence of uh, obesity. But you see a blue line and a red line. And in fact, we see uh, differences between countries. So uh, on the right-hand side are all the rich countries. But you can see on top, uh, USA, for example, and even Canada, So uh, where the gap between the rich and the poor is larger, the prevalence of, ob of obesity is uh, higher, as opposed to uh, this yellow line here, countries like Belgium and Sweden and uh, Norway, for, for instance, uh, the prevalence of obesity is much lower because the gap between the rich and the poor is smaller. So just by the way we govern our countries can have an impact on the waistlines of our population. So what can we do now? So uh, what can we do to address uh, obesity? Uh, I think we need to promote evidence-based population approaches. Uh, like we know more and more what can work, what can be done. Uh, so we need to... Uh, so. Uh, I think we, we publish a lot of papers of things like that, but I don't see a lot of actions with things that really matter and can impact lives of people struggling with uh, obesity. Examples of uh, recommendations, so to go out outside more often. So we know that we spend uh, much more time inside in our houses today compared to just 15 years ago. And just the benefits of being outside, much beyond the fact that we move more when we're outside, but with fresh fresh air, uh, connection with nature, and so on, we there's, much, there's a lot of uh, added 
benefits beyond that. Uh, remove screens from bedrooms, so we know that it, it reduces sleep quality and poor sleeping habits can lead to weight gain over time. Limit screen time because we tend to eat more when we engage in screen time. Uh, eat dinner as a family. Do not eat meals in front of the TV. Limit the intake of sugar, sweetened drinks. Uh, cons uh, eat at least uh, five servings of veggies and fruits per day. Uh, do not skip breakfast. Encourage breastfeeding. Get a good night's sleep and uh, be good role models for kids. <clears throat> and in fact, there's a lot of studies showing that if you want to address pediatric obesity, you need to start with their parents. Uh, because uh, studies are showing that if the parents change their, their behaviors or they lose weight, it has a positive impact on their, their kids. But if the kids change their behaviors or lose weight, no impact on their, their, their parents. So it's very important, and that's why in our programs here in Ottawa, uh, our pediatric uh, uh, obesity programs, we really uh, want to have the, the parents coming because if you just have a school program for, for kids and the parents are not in, involved, it, does, it doesn't work well. It can work well uh, in the school setting, but when the kids go back home and the parents they just watch TV, for example, and they eat uh, junk, junk food, it doesn't send a good message and over the long term, it doesn't work. Uh, with the Canadian Obesity Network, they have what we call the five A's of uh, pediatric obesity management. They have that for adults, for pregnant women, and so on. And I think it's a great tool, and uh, this is something that people should uh, uh, should should use. <clears throat> and what they use also is the Edmonton Obesity Staging System for pediatrics, but for adults as well, because we know that for uh, all people that are obese. Uh, some people are more at risk than others. So uh, obesity is, is just measured in terms of body mass in, in index. So it, it tells you how big you are, but not how sick you, you are. So we need to go beyond that. And what we want to do as healthcare providers is to improve health, mental health and physical health. So for the same uh, people with obesity, so they stage people, stage zero, one, two, and three. So people with uh, obese people, stage zero and one, they don't need to lose weight because they're healthy. When you look at their mental health and physical health, they're healthy. So we don't want to induce weight loss just because their BMI is not in the good zone. So we want to improve health. So we need to, it's a way to triage people as well and to really uh, help people in, in need of help. Uh, those having health problems. So stage two and stage three are those people that we need to help more. So it's a very complex and difficult task uh, in the current obesogenic environment. So there's no program to date that has proven to be effective in reversing the trend of childhood and adulthood obesity. And we need to target all levels, individual, family, neighborhood, policy, in order to make the, health, the healthy choice the easiest one for people. Um, so, for example, over the past few years, so we have uh, spent a lot of energy on the top of this uh, onion or, or circle. So we tried to we tried to fix people by telling them you need to eat less, you need to move more, and so on. And over the long term, it, it doesn't work well because we need to involve the, the parents, the, the whole family, the city, the province, and the whole country by having also policies that will help people. Uh, to make healthy choice where when the health healthy choice becomes uh, easier for, for, for people, that, that helps a lot. So we need to work at all levels to make sure that uh, we can uh, make a difference. It, and again, it's not only about reducing obesity, but we want people to be healthier. So it's more about health than uh, about uh, BMI. And I was telling that, uh, yeah, this is one study showing that if we want to address obesity uh, in uh, kids and teenagers, we need to start with their own parents because we can have a larger impact uh, by addressing parental obesity if we want to have an impact on children, uh, on childhood obesity. So are we leaders in Canada? Uh, I think uh, we are doing a couple of good things, but we uh, uh, we can do much more, of course. Uh, the cycling rate of 37% is not here, so in Canada it's about 1% to 2%. But this is in Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, they have like uh, backing paths everywhere, so that's just one thing. They were the first country in Denmark to ban trans fat uh, in 2003 because we know that trans fat is bad for us, for our heart, and so on. Uh, and we still 
don't have a clear ban of, of trans fat in Canada even in 2015. So there are things like that that, uh, that can be easy to do and that can help people. doesn't mean that by uh, having those policies, the rates of obesity will, will go down, but at least we're moving towards healthier lives and he uh, overall health of, of people uh, beyond, beyond just telling them to change their lifestyle. Uh, so what is a healthy body weight? So this is a body weight associated with healthy lifestyle habits, not associated with health problems and in which eating is still a pleasure. So when you open your, your pantry or your, your fridge, you should, not, you should not be stressed about it. So this is not a BMI in the normal, way, in the normal range. So if you look for adults, uh, we always say between 18.5 and 25, or for kids, we can use uh, uh, the 95th per percentile. So I think, uh, this, this tells you just how big you are, but not how sick you are. So we need to, move. it's about time that we move beyond BMI. Uh, we need to find the, the, good, uh, the good zone. So of course, with excess body weight, and especially when you gain a lot of weight in, uh, in your belly, which is more the, the bad fat, there are uh, some health problems associated with the metabolic syndrome. But when you lose weight, and I'm not talking about a lot of weight loss here, between 5 and 10%, the recommendation is 5 to 10% weight, weight loss, we see a lot of changes. So the drive to eat uh, goes up, your energy expenditure goes down, and so on. So that's why you see this, this plateau of weight loss at just at about 5 to 10%. So for, you can stick to the same diet, the same physical activity program, but will, you will not continue to lose weight unless you, you cut even more and you move it even more. So that's why it's tough for people to lose weight. So the better uh, treatment for obesity remains its prevention because once you have gained weight, it's very difficult to lose weight and maintain a reduced uh, obese state over the long term. So losing weight is not the problem, it's to keep the weight off over the long term. And that's why this, that's, what, uh, what's the, the, that's the real battle. And that, that's, uh, people are not able to do that, of course, because our bodies always fight to bring the weight up with uh, this increased drive to eat and uh, decrease in energy ex expenditure. So I think we need to uh, uh, spend more, more energy on health and changing behaviors and less on body mass index and body weight. So, and we realize that if we uh, focus too much on body weight as an indicator of success, it doesn't work. So it increases food and body preoccupation, increases the, the yo-yo, you lose, regain, lose, regain, and over the long term you tend to, to gain more. It reduces self-esteem, it increases eating disorders, it, it increases weight stigmatization and discrimination. And the main mission of CON, the Canadian Obesity Network, is to fight this, so to reduce weight bias and discrimination. I think uh, this is something uh, that we were doing over the past few years. So we're trying to come up with a program of people telling them to eat less and to move more. And if it, if it wasn't working, it was their own fault. And we know that it's not that. So there's just so many things at, at play here. And seeing like TV programs like The Biggest Loser, it doesn't work this, this way. So the more uh, you work, the more you can lose. No, it doesn't work this way. And the, the, the changes can be very different between people. So health is not measured in pounds, so when you step on your scale, it doesn't tell you if you're sick or if you're healthy or not. It tells you if, if you're uh, big or not. So I have like two examples here. Uh, Shaquille O'Neal, uh, he's very active, he was a basketball player, he's obese according to the, uh, the BMI, and Keith Richards. <clears throat> probably not very healthy because he's smoking and drinking a lot and drugs and so on. He's not very active. He's in the healthy body mass in the index range. So just to give you an idea that so health is more about our behaviors than really body mass index. So BMI is just one simple marker of health, but it doesn't tell you if you're healthy or not. There's, there's many obese people uh, very healthy when you look at mental health and physical health, and you have also uh, many lean people unhealthy. So I think we need to go beyond BMI. Uh, psychological health and obesogenic lifestyle. So for many, eating is the easiest and most affordable means of coping with stress, anxiety, depression, boredom, loneliness, isolation, abuse, despair, and frustration. And there was a famous quote by George, 
George Bernard Shaw many years ago, he was saying that there's no love more sincere than the love for, for food. Food is always there for us. Uh, so just saying that here, uh, there's many reasons why we can overeat and this is not people's fault. And there are many benefits of being active every day on overall health, regardless of weight loss. And even people can even gain weight with uh, when they go to the gym or uh, when they engage in a physical activity program because they can gain muscle mass. So it cannot. So uh, when you're active every day, so sleep quality is much more Im 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 improved. So you 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 sleep better. And people ask me because I'm I'm doing a lot of sleep research and ask me, uh, can you give me tips? Uh, I don't sleep very well. And I always ask them, the, are you physically active every day? And most of the time, no. We know that there's a physical inactivity crisis in Canada. And by being active, uh, you have you're more tired, so you, you sleep much better. So if you have this uh, mental fatigue, this is quite different compared to this physical fatigue. So with mental fatigue, you, you go to bed, you, you tend to uh, over, overthink, you think about your, your, your next day and you don't sleep well. So you need to be uh, physically tired. Uh, it improves also the management of stress. This is a pretty good thing, and also it can impact your energy and, and intake as well if you tend to eat more under uh, mental stress. It improves brain function, learning, memory, and so on. It improves cardiometabolic, uh, your, your cardiometabolic risk profile, the prevention of stroke, some forms of cancer, type 2 di diabetes, osteoporosis, sarcopenia, which is a loss of muscle mass with aging, uh, loss of function, autonomy, and it improves wellness. So we feel much better when, you're, when we are physically active and everything is linked together so uh, moving sleeping eating and so on so the more uh, healthy behaviors we have in our lives the, the better we are so no one is perfect I'm not you are not so I think the goal is to just change some of our behaviors so overall with 24 hours over a week and so on uh, the more healthy behaviors you we, we can have the best for our health. So, and sometimes what I don't like when people compare those behaviors, is it better to move or to eat well or to sleep well and so on? No, everything counts. They all count. They're all very uh, Im important. So uh, they, all, they all matter. So is it possible that the body says no, that for some people, they just can't lose weight? And I'm telling you, yes, it's possible. And this is... Uh, uh, women that we had in Quebec City a couple of years ago. So that was a 15-week weight loss program with physical activity and a weight loss diet. So we cut 500 calories per day in her diet over 15 weeks. You look at her body weight before and after, she gained two kilos after this 15-week program with exercise and diet. So we were kind of, okay, that's weird. So uh, we look at her food intake. So she, uh, so there was a decrease of 500 calories per day in her food intake. But when we measured her uh, resting metabolic rate, there was uh, uh, her body, so there was a decrease of 500 calories. So we cut 500 calories in her diet, and her, her body said, OK, I will cut 500 calories. So it was impossible for her to lose weight under this weight loss program because her body said no. And she gained two kilos because she gained muscle mass with this exercise program. But when we look at her, uh, her health profile, mental health, physical health, uh, she was fine. So improvement in uh, cholesterol and so on. Uh, so even though she gained weight, so again, just because she she changed her behaviors, she was much more health uh, much more healthy after, even though she gained weight. And uh, uh, so it was impossible for her to lose weight. So the take-home message for you, I guess, uh, that I want to say today is that we need to promote good practices that include physical activity, a healthy diet, uh, good night's sleep, and wellness, and let the body decide where a new body weight set point will be fixed. So we're obsessed a lot with body weight uh, in our uh, society, but as healthcare providers, we need to promote health and, of course, uh, BMI doesn't tell you if you're healthy or not, so we need to promote good practices. And we need many sandbags to build a levee. So there's a flood, so there's a, uh, we call that an epidemic of uh, obesity in, in Canada and around, and also in many other countries. But there are many things that people propose, so we, you probably heard about, okay, a tax on sugar or things like, like that. There are many things. All and in interventions taken alone 
will not reduce the prevalence of obesity. But is, is it a good reason uh, not to have them? I don't think so, because if the if n nothing can reduce uh, the prevalence of obesity, I think all the small things all together they will prevent this flood. So I think it uh, it's not a good ex excuse not to start uh, doing those those programs or those uh, uh, policies and, and so on. So I think we need to all work together at different levels to make the healthy choice the easy one for, for people. Uh, I think I had one last slide. Yeah, so, uh, okay, so if we're sleeping during a presentation, I have uh, six take-home messages for you. First one, obesity is not a, a choice. No one is immune. I'm not, you're not, so we never know what can happen in, in our future. So people don't decide to become obese. There are many factors, and this is very complex. It's important to target the root causes or the the key drivers of excess body weight and seeing excess food intake and lack of exercise as symptoms of something deeper as opposed to the real causes. Uh, it's important to have realistic ex expectations uh, because we, with even uh, weight loss pills, with uh, diet, exercise, and so on, uh, the best people can expect to lose weight is be between 5 and 10% uh, weight, weight loss. It's possible for some people to lose more than that, but in general, the average is 5 to 10%. For someone weighing 200 pounds, we're talking about 15 to 30 pounds, so still very obese. But uh, this is the expectations. Uh, action is uh, urgently needed to create supportive en environments for people to make the healthy choice the easy one for people to make. So I think we need uh, uh, policies for people that will help them. Uh, and I think at-risk populations should be uh, prioritized because like the, the poor people, those from low socioeconomic backgrounds, because we know they, they are more at, at risk of health problems than other people. And we need to invest more in prevention because we know it works. And as I was telling you, the best treatment for obesity remains its prevention because uh, when uh, we're obese, uh, it's very difficult to lose weight and to keep the weight off over the long term because the body is always fighting to bring the, the weight back. So we need to uh, change more our behaviors and let the body decide where the body weight set point uh, will be fixed. So thank you very much again for your attention. Uh, and now I think we have plenty of time for questions. And here is my email address, our uh, website, and uh, Twitter. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. All right. Thank you, Dr. Chaput. That's a fantastic presentation. I mean, you certainly pulled a lot of different pieces in that I don't think uh, when we hear about obesity, we, we don't see all, the, all of these pieces side by side. And you certainly made the case for the importance of each one of those pieces and the interplay of all of those pieces. So really fantastic presentation. And anything that gets me to, or convinces me to get more sleep, I think I can't argue with that. So that's always an easy one. But uh, we do have some questions. So uh, just again, my reminder to uh, the audience: if you do have questions, type them into the question box that's in the bottom of the control panel that's on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, the first question came in from Hillary, and she's asking: you, know, you, you really talked a lot about sleep, sort of adding that to the mix, particularly with the diet, exercise, sleep, and then some other things. But you really spoke quite a bit about sleep. Uh, and and the issues of you know how do you get people to get more sleep? She's asking what policy recommendations would you recommend to address sleep duration? I mean we've seen lots of policies in different countries and provinces across Canada about you know how to regulate food uh, intake versus the trans fats and that sort of thing and 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 lots of policies around exercise and promoting more exercise. But sleep seems might, like it might be a little bit more challenging at the policy level. Do, do you have any any thoughts on on or, or are you aware of any policies uh, around sleep? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think first we need to uh, talk more about that to promote the importance of a good night's sleep for overall health because I think I still believe that many people uh, think that sleep is a waste of, of time. So uh, if you want to cut somewhere in your, your 24 hour for pleasure and wellness and so on, it'd be, uh, people will cut on their sleep uh, duration uh, without uh, understanding the uh, the uh, adverse effects of uh, chronic sleep loss over time. So I think we need to have uh, recommendations like in the in the US, so it will come in 2016, so to know what people should sleep between this range and, and, and this range, and to talk more about the, 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 the sleep tips. Uh, for example, 
And just to remove all gadgets from our bedrooms, uh, I think I know many people, uh, they just watch TV, they use their laptops before going to, to bed, so the blue light coming from our screens uh, impacts our sleep quality, and we, talk, we don't talk a lot about that, and there's more and more studies looking at this, even though we don't feel a, a difference when we measure in a sleep lab someone who goes to bed using uh, his tablet than someone not, we see a differences in his, his sleep quality. So it, it impacts sleep quality. So we need to remove all gadgets from our bedrooms and other tips like we need to sleep in a room that is dark, uh, that is cool, no pets in our bedrooms and things like, like that. So it's more to promote those kind of uh, messages to, to, to people that uh, good night's sleep is very Im important for o o overall health and it can impact our eating behaviors and our physical like activity behaviors. But beyond that, for kids, uh, of course, we can have rules in the, the household. So parents should have rule, rules about bed, bedtime. We know for teenagers, uh, uh, some policies we're talking about the school start time because we know that's normal for teenagers to go to sleep later and wake up later. So it's not normal to them to wake up very early. So just to postpone school start time by 30 minutes for teenagers can have, and many studies have tested that, a huge effect on their attention, on their success in, in school, so it has an impact on uh, academic uh, achievement and so on. So I will say gadget in the, in the bedroom, school start time for teenagers are probably two key things that we can have uh, policies about on top of uh, talking more about sleep and the benefits of a good night's sleep. To, to dwell too much on the, on the sleep, I mean, you're, you're an obesity researcher, not a sleep researcher, but uh, I, I just wonder the, the challenges of, it. when we talk about weight, we always get focused on the number, and you, you know, you talked a lot about it's not about, you know, number of pounds or the BMI, and I wonder about the challenges of avoiding that with sleep as part of this mix and focusing on the number of hours versus some less tangible measurement of the quality of the sleep. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I think uh, everything matters, but for kids, uh, in general, they pretty all have good sleep quality unless they have a sleep problem. So the sleep quality decreases with age most of the time, mainly. So for kids, if we target kids and teenagers, the amount tends to matter more than quality because they all have good sleep quality in, in, in general. And with sleep timing, so it's more about bedtime, studies tend to show that for the same amount of sleep, the same sleep duration, if kids and teenagers go to bed later and wake up later, as opposed to going to bed earlier and waking up earlier, uh, they engage in more screen time, they're more obese, their diet quality is less good, and so on. So just the bedtime part, that, for me, has an effect on sleep duration, because if you go to bed earlier, and then you will have uh, more time in your in your bed, so you a better sleep uh, duration, and... Uh, like the, the sleep quality will, will be good too. So I think the, the bedtime part for, for kids and teenagers is probably key in, the, in setting uh, policies. All right. But easier said than done if for anyone who has little kids. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> it's not easy. No, no. <laughs> the, uh, the next question came in from Kira. Uh, she's asking, how do you assess whether a child is at a healthy body weight? For example, for kids who may be over the 85th, per 85th percentile for BMI, could they be considered le leaving the healthy weight trajectory? They may not be experiencing health problems currently, but should this group be targeted for an intervention to prevent uh, health problems in the future? Yeah, so we tend to use the CDC guidelines. So that's a 95th uh, percentile to look at uh, obesity in kids, the 85th is for uh, overweight. But for young kids, I think it's more important to track over time, so not to look at just this amount this year, but to look if it goes more up or maybe it comes down again. So it's more over the years if it looks like the, 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 the kid is going way up. So as long as the health is good, I think we don't want to promote weight loss, even in children, because we just uh, it's important to look at overall health. And by inducing weight loss, we can create more problems. So first, do not harm. That's a key thing. And we know that, and I've seen that uh, in many weight loss programs for kids and then for, for teenagers, we, we were creating more problems by inducing weight loss. First, they're not happy. No one is happy to follow a weight loss diet and to uh, skip screen time and things like, like that. So uh, if 
overall health is good, you don't want to create more harm. So it's always a case by case because it's always different, but it's more to track over time because things can change and there are many uh, things that can happen as well and to discuss the, the parents and so on. But uh, yeah, it's more tracking over time that, that matters to me. Yeah. All right, uh, the next question uh, came from Jennifer. She's asking, is there an evidence-based tool to screen for lifestyle? And I'm assuming she means a you know a single tool that would pull in all of these pieces that you're talking about around diet and weight and sleep and, and all of these other sort of lifestyle focused things. Do you know if there's a, a, a screen a screening tool of any kind? Yeah, that's a very good question, and I'm not aware of any screening screening tool looking at all of those lifestyle behaviors together. So we have like tools for physical activities and behavior, for sleep, for mental health, and so on. But one all together, uh, I'm not aware of that. Uh, uh, what Khan is using for their, their five A's, they look into all of the possible like drivers, uh, but uh, no, I'm not aware of that. I think it will be very relevant to have one with simple questions that can really have a good uh, overview. I think all groups in Canada, they have their own tools, but we all like come up with our tools. It's like a melting pot of different questions, but uh, like each and every group group can have a different kind of tool for lifestyle behaviors. So they all look similar, but they can be different too, depending on what they, they, they believe is more important and, and so on. Even between scientists, we also argue and we don't, we don't ha agree on everything, even though there's always a, a, gray, a gray zone. But I'm not aware of a standardized and a good like tool for all of the lifestyle behaviors together. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, uh, Jolene has just uh, put in a, a comment that the lifestyle screening tool that they use is the FNPA, the Family Nutrition Physical Activity Tool from Greg Welk out of Iowa State University in the U.S. Well, there's an example of something that may get a, a, some of that information. But yeah. Um, so thank you, Jolene. Um, so we we don't have many questions left. Uh, so it's sort of just a chance to remind everyone: if you do have questions, please do uh, type them in. Um, the one question. Uh, Another question that's here is 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 about are there any examples of countries that have managed to reverse the trend in obesity? Has, has anyone that has any country that has or region that has experienced an obesity problem been successful in reversing it? Uh, not really. You can see like in subgroup of the population, but if you look at the overall, not really. We have some countries that are doing better than others, like the Scandinavian countries and things like that. But and over the past, I will say, five to six years, uh, we see this kind of, of plateau, even in the U.S. and in Canada. So we're we're always uh, even when I go to presentation, I hear people saying that we're getting fatter and fatter. But this is not true now. So the rates are very high. If we look at overweight and obesity combined in Canada, is two two thirds of the population is either overweight or obese. So it's normal now to be either overweight or obese. So the rates are high, but we kind of plateau. It makes sense. At some point, people were saying that in 2020, 100% of people will be obese if you look at the, over the past few years. It, it's, not, it's not true. So some people will always remain lean, even though they're faced with this uh, obesogenic en environment. And some people will always be obese. So there's a normal curve. But this shift, it was more. Uh, that occurred over the past year was more between like 1970 to 2000. But I think uh, there are many things we can do to uh, not just to bring those figures down. I think from a political standpoint, it looks better. But for me, it's more about health. So I need, we need to embrace as well larger bodies. It's not only a problem because it puts a lot of pressure and stress on people to be lean, to be like their, the, the models uh, that they see on, on, on TV and so on. So there's a lot of uh, eating uh, behaviors associated with that that are not good. So, And this is why the CON in Canada, their main mission is to reduce weight bias and this discrimination because uh, even me, even I, I see other scientists, when they see an obese person, you always think, oh, this person should move more and should, should eat, eat less. But I know many of these people, uh, they eat even less than lean people. I know also many lean people, they eat a lot. So our genes explain a lot, uh, our body weight. So uh, this weight bias, is, uh, it's not very good to helping 
us to find better solutions and to address that. But uh, I think at some point it might go down. But because it went up, the first thing is to find this, this plateau, and maybe it will go down. So it cannot go up and then down. So it, you need to find a, a plateau first. And then if our program and solution work, maybe over the long term it will go down. But uh, let's see. I, I, I still see a lot of uh, obesogenic pressures in 2015, so uh, it's, been not, it's not going to be uh, very easy. Yeah. Um, what do you see as the most successful policies that have been tried, the ones that have, that have made a difference? I mean, we talk about everything from in New York City about reducing the size of sugar drinks that people can buy to, you know, everything else that's been tried. Can you, what, can, if you can think of one or two uh, policy level, th you know, things, what would, what would you say would be the, the ones that have made the most difference? Uh, it's tough to know because to assess those, the impact of those policies, uh, it's very difficult because there are many other things that happen at, at, the, at the same time. So to make sure that this change is due to this policy only, it's almost Im 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 impossible to know. But I will say uh, uh, yeah, control on portion size is probably a, a good thing. A ban on trans fat is probably a good thing for health more than for body weight. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and it depends also between countries. One policy can work well in one context and not in a different context. So uh, we cannot compare USA to Africa, Europe, or so it's all different. So we need to work uh, by region, by communities, and so on. So what can work in Alberta might not work in uh, Ottawa, for example. So okay. it's very it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for uh, this is for uh, Jolene who post, posted the, the comment about the lifestyle screening tool. There's a, a couple of people who are asking for if they can get more information about that. So if you can uh, just send a link or, or something in the uh, question box, I can pass that along. Uh, a couple of people are saying that uh, a tool that would address or that would assist providers to identify the lifestyle area to focus on, on for their intervention would be great, and something that's easy to complete in a busy practice setting would be would be great as well. And so lots of people asking about that lifestyle screening tool. If, uh, it was called the FNPA, but I don't know, uh, by uh, Greg Welk out of Iowa State University. But if anyone has any other suggestions for these types of tools that people might want to consider, uh, you know, please uh, please don't hesitate to share. Um, and uh, Julian did send in a link, so I'll put that in the, uh, in the, in the comment box for everyone to see in just a second. Uh, we did have a question about, uh, 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 from Fiona, who's asking, how do you address mental well-being to support the prevention and weight loss efforts? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, this isn't a very uh, easy task, I would say. <clears throat> um, I'm not the expert of mental health per se, but I think, uh, yeah, so at first it depends what kind of mental health we're talking about. Is it more about uh, depression and, and anxiety and, and so on? But if we talk about energy balance and body weight here, so maybe to reduce uh, emotional eating or things like, like that, uh, working with a team of uh, psychologists and social workers is very uh, important. So in many like weight loss programs, you see one person working for the diet side, one for the physical activity side, but the mental health is always uh, neglected and I think it's a very key part of uh, our behaviors too so if you feel happy uh, I think uh, by working on, on mental health uh, it can have a large impact on eating behaviors and physical activity behaviors so I think having a psychologist as part of the of the team for me it's key it's at least at least as important if not more than uh, working on diet and exercise but mm -hmm. it's not a very easy task yeah, and and she po sort of posted a follow-up saying she's not really referring to a diagno diagnosed mental illness, but some of the comments that you were making about the challenges that people have of focusing on weight and the the the, the impact on mental well-being of yeah of and no body uh, image and, and, yeah. and so yeah. on yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. To but same embrace uh, larger bodies and to yeah to be less guilty about things uh, yeah yeah yeah. Because yeah, the, the message we're sending to people is that 
the obesity epidemic is bad, therefore they have to lose weight, and they realize that it's very difficult to lose weight and keep the weight off, and with, with this yo-yo, it impacts mental health too. So people are frust frustrated because it's difficult to lose weight first, and it's normal that it's difficult to lose weight. Uh, you see TV program like The Biggest Loser at its work, but we now published studies showing that all of those biggest losers, they regain all of their weight and they even more, and they don't talk about that. So I think we need to be very honest with, with people that what you're seeing is not true. Like, it doesn't work this way. The buddies will fight to keep the, the this weight back, and I think we need to be very honest with people that if you embark in a weight loss program, it's a struggle for the rest of your life. You will have to fight for the rest of your life. And people don't realize that. They think that, okay, as as soon as I, my weight uh, is gone after one year, then I'll, I, I'll be able to go back to my older, older habits. No, you have to struggle for the rest of your life. If not, then don't start. start. <laughs> All right. Um, Jennifer posted a, a, a link as well saying that BC has a new weight bias and stigma education resource for healthcare providers. And she put a link there, Balanced View, uh, at www.balancedviewbc.ca. We just posted that link. So that might be another uh, uh, a resource as well. And uh, Jolene also put a different link available for the FNPA the, uh, uh uh, screening tool, the myfnpa.org, for you know again for anyone who wants more uh, information about that. Um, you know again an another question about sort of the policy approach. Is there a way to address this through policy or public health approach? I mean I, that seems to be the the question of the day. Is 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 like you said, it's about the, that onion diagram that you put up there about the the, the city level, the regional, the provincial, the national, and even international. You know, any anything else you can add about the the policy approach or ways we can you know address this through policy? Yeah, yeah. so I think we need more action there because. The top-down approach with policies, that helps people to make the healthy jersey easiest one. Just here at Chio, we're in the process of getting rid, uh, getting rid of the, the French fries at, uh, here. And it's kind of uh, weird that it, in a hospital, a Chio, big like, like this, we can find French fries everywhere. Like people can, do, can go to make McDonald's and so on. But at least when they come here, they expect uh, to have a healthy and, and environment. So it doesn't make sense to me to sell French fries here. And it doesn't mean that you're not allowed to eat that. Uh, sometimes we need to send a message that uh, there are some policies that can work. And when I was in Denmark and they banned trans fat uh, in their country, that means that the Big Mac I was eating uh, in Copenhagen was healthier than the Big Mac in Ottawa because by default there was no trans fat. So people don't even change their their habits or their uh, eating habits or their, their, their lifestyle. But it becomes by default healthier without knowing that. And that's very powerful to me because it goes much beyond like changing something. By default, it, it becomes healthy. And the unhealthy choice now is the default. So we need to help people without, uh, they don't realize, but it becomes easy. If we have like biking paths everywhere, it becomes easy for people to walk, they just feel safe, and active transportation is part of their lifestyle. But if it's easier for people to use their, their car to go everywhere, of course they will do that. We, uh, we tend to do what's easier for us and cheaper and things like that. So if the, the cheap options are the the healthy options as opposed to the unhealthy ones, though uh, people, I'm sure more people will buy the, the cheap healthy options. So things like that can be very powerful for people and we need to, I think we should not underestimate the, the impact of policies on people's choice because just targeting behaviors, trying to fix people, we know doesn't work. So we need more than that and I think policies can be very powerful. Yes, but the question is, did that Big Mac in Copenhagen taste as good as the one over here in North America? <laughs> I didn't see any difference, so I would say yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so it can be done then. All right, change can be possible. All right, well, I think we have exhausted the uh, questions from the audience, So, uh, and we, we, we are almost out of time. We're, we almost filled the full hour and a half, but uh, a little bit early, we maybe we'll finish off. So maybe we'll just pass it over to you, Dr. Shaput, for any, anything you'd like to close the session off with, any final comments, any any conferences, or, or maybe maybe even with any of the, the any new uh, research from the uh, the HALO research group that you'd want to just mention before you leave, just things for people to keep an eye out for. 
Yeah, so I don't have any burning things I want to announce or say. I would just, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for uh, organizing this event. Um, again, I'm a bit sad I cannot see you because I always prefer to see people when I'm uh, presenting. And feel free to email me or to ask me any other questions if you have uh, other questions or to also call me. It will be a pleasure for me. And I think, uh, yeah, I think we are, we all need to work together to make uh, not just a healthy Turkey easy one, but just to help people to have a better uh, Canada, I will say. Uh, I think we can all make a, a difference, even though it's a small one, but each and every of us can make a small difference, and overall it can have a big impact. And I think, uh, yeah, the fact that we understand more what we have to do and to shift the, the focus more from a BMI to health, I think it will uh, help it's uh, and again it's very complex and uh, there are many things to think about and beyond with uh, what we know but we need champions and I think uh, uh, maybe with the new uh, government it, uh, we will find more of those those policies for health and less about uh, money making so I hope mm -hmm. so I uh, will see a, a difference so I also just I want to say thank you very much all right well thank you and I, and I must say I think this is probably the best, most realistic uh, presentation on obesity I think I've ever heard. I mean, you really put a lot of the pieces together. You didn't make it sound easy. There's no not simple solutions, but possible solutions. It is possible, and you gave us a lot of good things to think about. So, so great presentation, and thank you very much for that. Thank you. And thank you to our uh, to our audience uh, for uh, your contributions, Jolene, for the links and all that sort of thing about the uh, the, the the resources on this, the lifestyle screening tools and that sort of thing. So hopefully everyone will check that out and. And, uh, and thanks for, for your contributions there. Um, we do our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And as you can see, it's always great when you can watch live as you can contribute, you can ask questions, you can really enrich the discussion. But when you can't watch live, we do record these sessions, as I mentioned, and make them available after the fact on the Ken. Uh, so you should get a link to that in a few days. Um, next week, uh, we or actually on Friday this week, we have uh, our monthly CAFC Patient Safety Collaborative presentation, their monthly webinar. And they will be presenting on Never Events for Hospital Care in Canada. And Never, Never Events will be about a great discussion about events that cause harm but are that are known to be preventable using current knowledge and practices um, so we'll be welcoming presenters uh, to that uh, presentation from the health from health quality Ontario and the Canadian Patient Safety Institute and just a reminder the patient safety collaboratives webinars are open to anyone so just as uh, CAFC presents on Wednesdays uh, open to anyone and free uh, so is the patient safety collaborative so uh, don't hesitate to uh, join them on that call if you are interested in hearing the latest on uh, uh, patient safety initiatives across Canada and then on December Second, we'll be hearing again from our colleagues in neonatal and pediatric in the neonatal and pediatric transport community, who will be talking about administrative and operational challenges in neonatal and pediatric transport, interfacing clinical care with transport regulations, and it's going to be a great discussion about uh, the the impact uh, that occurs when clinical care meets with transport regulations, or health you know, the health sector meets with the transport sector, and how uh, practitioners often have to uh, be creative when trying to make sure they can deliver uh, the best clinical care amidst uh, regulations that aren't necessarily taking health care into consideration. Um, so it's going to be a great presentation on December 2nd. We do always have our, uh, every Tuesday, our email newsletter goes out with uh, new information about webinar, upcoming webinars or the available recorded webinars. So don't hesitate to go to our website to sign up for that newsletter if you don't already get it. Um, so some great stuff coming up uh, in the next few weeks. And thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and, and for such a great presentation from Dr. Shaput and from the CHEO Research Institute for their support and for bringing this information to us. And we hope to see everyone uh, back here uh, next week. So bye everyone and hopefully we'll see you soon.